continue to make sure that we have jobs for those who are brave enough to serve us in distant places. God bless America. God bless our troops. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from, Mr. from Texas, Mr. Nogabauer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor and remember the Honorable Judge Rusty Ladd, a great man, a tireless public servant, and an advocate for the homeless. Larry Brown Rusty Ladd passed away Friday, September 30th, 2011, and he will be missed by all who knew him. I was privileged to know Judge Ladd, and I know the legacy he leaves behind will not soon be forgotten by his family, his friends, or his community, and especially Irene and the children. Rusty was born in Breckenridge, Texas, on August 8, 1952, as the oldest son of a cotton ginner. He graduated from Lubbock Christian College in 1975 with a degree in biblical studies and joined the police force in 1977. In 1988, he graduated from the Texas Tech Law School and soon started his own practice as a defense attorney in Dallas. He moved back to West Texas as a prosecutor in Amarillo and Plainview, and in 1996 he continued practice in Lubbock as an assistant and then deputy district attorney at the Lubbock County District Attorney's Office. In 1999, Dusty, Rusty uh, assumed the judge bench of the Lubbock County Court at Law No. 1. When he took the bench, he said, I'm a new judge, and in taking the bench, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to fulfill my oath to defend the laws of the state in an absolutely fair and impartial way. He was true to his word, serving fairly and impartially, compassionate when possible, firm when necessary. Rusty showed his kindness not only to the, in the courtroom, but also in the streets of Lubbock. He opened his heart to the homeless in the Lubbock community, serving on the Homeless Committee of the Lubbock City Council since 2010 and volunteering through Carpenter's Church. Rusty dedicated his time and effort to serving the poor and the marginalized. The thing about homeless person misses the most is not the food and shelter, Lad said. It's the genuine relationship with somebody that's got a stable life going on. His Christ-like attitude toward the poor is inspiring, and I hope that and pray that we can continue the selfless acts that he initiated. Mr. Speaker, please join me in extending my sincere thanks to Judge Rusty Ladd for leaving this world a better place than he found it, and I'm truly honored to recognize his accomplishments. He will certainly be missed, but he will never be forgotten by those who knew him and he, he touched their lives. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Berkeley, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my strong support for the Emergency Unemployment Compensation Extension Act of 2011. This legislation will extend unemployment insurance one additional year, preventing six million people across our nation and thousands of Nevadans from losing their unemployment benefits. This is especially important in my home state of Nevada, which continues to struggle with the highest unemployment rate in the nation. Nevada's unemployed need good paying jobs that can't be shipped overseas, and that's why I'm focused like a laser on creating clean energy jobs and cracking down on the Chinese government's unfair trade practices that are cheating Nevadans out of thousands of, of good paying jobs. But Nevadans also need relief in their job search. What they don't need is name calling. Unfortunately, that's what they're getting in Washington. In fact, one of our representatives had the nerve to suggest that unemployment insurance is creating a nation of hobos. Hobos? Mr. Speaker, no one wants to be unemployed, no one wants to be out of work, and no one wants to be called a hobo. No one has ever come up to me and said, Shelley, Congresswoman, I love being unemployed. Life on unemployment is such a picnic. No, they're not saying that. They say, Shelley, Congresswoman, I want a job. Find me a job. I want to work so I can take care of my family. Mr. Speaker, Nevada's unemployed are not hobos. They're unemployed through no fault of their own, and they're desperate, desperate to find a job. They can't afford not to work, and they can't afford the kind of elitist and insulting attitude representing them in Congress. They need all of us in the House and the Senate working day and night to fix our economy and put people back to work. 
They don't have time for ideological battles about killing Medicare by turning it over to a private insurance company. They don't have time for vote after vote protecting tax giver, taxpayer giveaways to big oil companies. It's time to get serious about creating jobs, and it's time we get serious about extending critical unemployment insurance for families in Nevada and across our nation. I ask my colleagues to support me in this much-needed bill, and I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Wolf, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. General Electric, the nation's largest corporation, had a very good year in 2010. These were the opening words of a March 24 New York Times article. The article continued to explain that GE paid zero taxes in the U.S. in 2010. Meanwhile, the Congressional Research Service found that the October 2008 issue of China Taxation Magazine published top corporate taxpayers in the commercial service sector. The Beijing subsidiary of GE was number 32. While we don't yet have the data regarding GE's tax payments in China for 2010, it is noteworthy that GE, an American company, paid no federal taxes in its home country last year while being honored for being a significant source of tax revenue to China. China, with its horrific human rights abuses, persecution of people of faith, censorship of the press, cyber espionage in support of rogue regimes like President Bashir of Sudan where there's genocide taking place and increasingly aggressive military posture. This should give the Congress pause. It is particularly alarming in the midst of economic trouble at home, but my concern does not end there. U.S. companies like GE are increasingly sending American jobs to China. General Electric's health care unit recently announced it was moving its headquarters of its 115-year-old x-ray business from Wisconsin to Beijing. Ironically, the head of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitive is GE Chairman Jeffrey Immelt. Meanwhile, half of GE's workforce is overseas. He's creating jobs, but he's creating jobs in China. GE's posture toward China has economic implications here at home, in addition to the national security ramifications. This week, I wrote Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, urging him to conduct a national security review of the recently announced joint venture between General Electric, GE, and the Chinese firm AVIC to develop avionics for systems for jets. This partnership is troubling for a number of reasons, including the rapid advances in Chinese aeronautics and space program, and the unprecedented Chinese threat from cyber attacks and espionage. Yet according to an August Washington Post article, GE has dismissed concerns about providing the People's Liberation Army with advanced avionics technology. Lorraine Bolsinger, chief executive of GE's aviation system, said, quote, we are all in and we don't want it back. Wow. Is this true? They don't want it back? They want to give technology to the People's Liberation Army? Statements like this fail to acknowledge reality. According to a November 4 article from the Washington Post, the administration's office of the National Counterintelligence Executive had issued a warning that, quote, Chinese actors are the world's most active and persistent perpetrators of economic espionage, end of quote. Prolific Chinese espionage is having a real and corrosive effect on job creation. Given the breadth and scope of this espionage, which is well documented by the U.S. Intelligence Committee, GE's public assertion that they will be able to fully protect sensitive technology lacks credibility. Should the GE AVIC joint venture proceed, there is no question that the sensitive technology involved will be completely compromised by the People's Liberation Army. GE has a proud tradition as an American company, and it's past time for companies like GE to bring the jobs back to America. To date, there have been no plans from this administration to do just that. But when the House takes up the minibus appropriation bill later this week, 
that will change. I work to include provisions to help bring back manufacturing jobs to the U.S. from China and other countries. This can help state and local governments better compete for those jobs. American workers are among the most skilled in the world. American ingenuity is our greatest strength. We can and must compete. It is time to bring the jobs home. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, speaker. I rise today in support of the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Our debt burden in this country is so heavy. It is no longer simply a financial issue. It is a moral issue. We have spent and spent racking up astronomical debt that will dampen the American dream for our children and grandchildren. If we continue on this path, we will guarantee that future generations will have unsustainable tax burdens, monstrous inefficient bureaucracies, and a lifestyle so diminished that it will no longer resemble the America we all know and love. That is not what our founding fathers had in mind when they formed this great nation. In fact, in 1798, Thomas Jefferson wrote, I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution. I mean an additional article taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Thomas Jefferson could never in his wildest dreams have ima imagined that our debt would one day top $14 trillion, threatening our very way of life. And unfortunately, this is a problem that only gets worse every year that we produce a budget, our spending grows. Ronald Reagan had it right when he said, no government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. A government program is the nearest thing on earth we'll ever see to eternal life. And that was back in the 1980s, when our debt was a fraction of what it is now. Our debt has grown so out of control that it not only saddles future generations with our irresponsibility, but it poses a national security threat to our country today. Former Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, recently stated that our increasing debt is the biggest threat that we have to our national security. We are playing with fire and it is time to stop, and it's time to do the right thing. Not only do 49 states have a balanced budget amendment, but Americans all across the country have to balance their household budgets. It is time for Congress to do the same and balance America's checkbook. Some of our friends on the other side of the aisle agree. In a recent letter to House members, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, asked his colleagues to buck their leadership and vote for the balanced budget amendment. He said going against it is a strategic mistake, and I agree. His party's leadership ev evidently disagrees, and a recent headline in USA Today says it all. House Dems will block the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Unfortunately, they will be on the wrong side of history. It is time for us to take a stand and do the right thing. Let's stand on the side of our children and our grandchildren and on the side of Jefferson and Reagan and with those who believe the safety and security of our country should come before our short-term insatiable appetite for ever-increasing government spending. The time is now. Let's support the balanced budget amendment and put an end to fiscal insanity that threatens this great country. Thank you, and with that, I yield back. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until 12 noon today. And the House is in recess now for the next 45 minutes until noon Eastern. And when they gavel back in, they will work on a bill repealing a 3% tax withholding for.